I love this part because right now we're in the middle where we can actually talk about real proteins, but we can do it at a slightly more advanced terms and a much better understanding than what we had at the beginning of the course. So I'm going to continue a bit of the theme. Yesterday I finished up talking about membrane proteins and today I'm going to talk about lots of different proteins but not necessarily focusing on the individual proteins. I'm going to keep my voice down a little bit not to disturb Joe too much. They're having their course on scientific writing there. And the reason for looking at more proteins is partly related to what you did in the bioinformatics course. Uh, one protein is certainly important function-wise, but if you want to understand nature, you need to understand the diversity of all proteins. Um, so why do you have 20,000 genes in your body? It's because they do different things. And why did those 20,000 proteins end up the way they did? Speaking about the number of genes, so as I just build the beans there, you have roughly 20,000 genes. Is that a lot or a little? So it's way less than we thought, right? Um, a small bacterium can get by with a few thousand genes, possibly even less. Uh, I think there is a paper, I think it's part of the lectures today, where, or might have been yesterday too, where um, Craig Venter a few years ago showed that they could design an artificial genome. So they created a minimal, an organism with a minimal genome. So they just created the very, the smallest set of genes that they could imagine that still created a functioning bacterium. If you look at the other extreme, Norwegian spruce, do you have any idea how many genes there is in a Christmas tree? Roughly 200,000. And you thought humans were fancy. You're roughly one tenth as fancy as a Christmas tree. It's pro we have no idea, well, there, we, we do have some ideas why, but part of it, of course, has to do with evolutionary pressure. There is less pressure, evolutionary pressure in Christmas trees, while bacteria, on the other hand, they have to be mean, super efficient machines, or they're not going to be able to survive. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about the whole concept of folds, and I'm going to keep talking about folds in general. We're going to talk a little bit about evolution, um, protein sizes, why things have the size they do. Uh, and then we're going to start looking at the whole concepts of faults and the distribution over faults. And this is going to look just like Boltzmann distributions, but it's going to turn out that that's completely wrong. Uh, well, not completely wrong, uh, because it's going to be related to it, but it's not a Boltzmann distribution. And we're going to talk about this duality between sequence and structure, um, and eventually start coming into a little more about the stabilization. Why are proteins stable? When are they stable? What happens if you destabilize proteins? What is the most normal way we, we, you could imagine that we're going to destabilize proteins? Mutations. Mutations in general destabilize proteins. In a few rare cases, they might stabilize them. So this, the reason for the stabilization is not just a theoretical exercise, whether we are going to be interested in the physics, but it's going to tell us something about what mutations are likely to stabilize or disrupt proteins. Let's see, I should have, oh yes, there. I should have some lecture slides, notes for you. Nine, nine, nine. Pass those around. And then we're gradually going to get a bit into transitions between states. And um, depending on how much time we have, we'll get some theolosteric modulation either today or tomorrow. Um, yes? I agree um, You've done this a couple of times now. So I'm going to take a step even further back and let you handle this. Pick some questions and talk about them. I'm more than happy to help you answer them if you can't, or comment on your answers at least. Some of them I might not explicitly have talked about yesterday, like 11 or 12, but that's a good reason to either you look them up or we're going to talk about them this morning. So I have time to wait. <laughs> so should we just start with the pick one. Well, you can pick one. The, uh, the first one or the easiest one or the most difficult one. Anything you like.
Mm -hmm. So all these things are right, but when are these large questions, and, I, and again, some of these are, let's break it down into parts. The first thing you said is super important, that you can't have the high hydrogen bonds whisper around facing the lipids. And that per se is going to cause a strong, strong, strong effect that favors one secondary structure, which is what? Alpha helices. That is the main reason I would say why membrane proteins are to 95 or even 99% alpha helical. So then we take one mark off. That, that explains why we stabilize the secondary structure we have. The second thing you mentioned was what? So well, yes and no. If you compare this to a globular protein, right? Um, how is this different from a globular protein? Right, but that's the definition of globular versus membrane protein. So when the stabilize, say, what is the stabilization of a globular protein? The main stabilizing. Hydrophobic. Yes, hydrophobic collapse or something, right? You need to have the hydrophobic parts on the inside and hydrophilic parts on the outside. That is obviously not true for a membrane protein. Yep. Because you only have but that per se is not the stabilization effect, just being hydrophobic. So what is that stabilizes membrane proteins? <coughs> Van der Waals packing, or aggregation, whatever you call it. And it's a much, much, much weaker and delicate stabilization than globular proteins in general. So it's more complicated to predict than everything. And I think that partly covers two other differences in interactions compared to globular proteins. Um, one thing I can mention there that I didn't have time, well, we, we indirectly mentioned it. Are there, are there never any hydrophilic or polar residues in membrane proteins? Where? Like in, um, in the edges? In the edges, I would say, yes. Uh, so facing the membrane surface. Um, why do they occur there? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine any advantage with that? So imagine I'll draw two cases. First, this is my big droplet of oil. And then I'm going to draw my helix here. And then a second helix here. And let's, I can even assume that they're connected. And then I'll draw a second case. Here's a membrane. We have oil. What's the difference here? In terms of structure-wise and stability, which one do you think is going to be most stable? Why? Because uh, if there are charges on the leaves, <coughs> they have to go into the... So th there are two parts here, right? Um, one of them is that, sorry, it's quite right, that one part is that you want to be hydrophobic to stay in here. But again, if you're hydrophobic everywhere, and if you're hydrophobic in the loops, you could start to slide up or down, right? And that's pretty bad. So that, surprisingly, the fact, it's good to have hydrophobic things here, but it's also important to not have hydrophobic things up here. Because that's what's create the edge that prevents, it. you can't slide the helix down, and you can't slide the helix up. So it's stuck in the membrane, exactly where we want it to be. And there are, a number of very common patterns you see in proteins. So first you have a, the number of residues in here that are alpha helical is uh, roughly in the ballpark of 20 and now I should have had a, an eraser. Well, uh, I'll get that later. Um, so you have roughly 20 amino acids in the middle and then you frequently have motifs such as glycine, glycine, proline, glycine. They do two things. First, both glycine and proline break helices. And if you put four helical breaking residues after each other, you can imagine that that helix is dead. So it creates a very sharp boundary of the helix. It's helix here, and then it's no longer helix. And the other thing, many of these residues, proline is one of them, but also tryptophan. It's very common to see those residues in the end, not even out in the loops, but at the very end of the helix in membrane proteins, because it helps anchor the membrane proteins vertically. 
So do you know some typical functions of membrane proteins? Any particular function that might be different in membrane proteins compared to globular ones, or fibrous ones for that matter? Hmm? Yes, and that's quite right. I would always say if you would use one name for all that, I would say transport processes. Anything that's going to move things across something, and that's what you call transport. There is a famous theoretical uh, argument actually by Onsager in the, from the 1960s, I think it was, where he actually proved that to maintain any type of process, in particular life, you need a system with anisotropy. And what the membrane creates is creates this anisotropy. Because if you have a homogeneous anisotropic system, it's theoretically impossible to keep any sort of process going in it, even if you feed it with energy. You will reach equilibrium. So what all these membranes actually help us do, it helps you create separate compartments in the body and in your cell. And that separation is what makes it possible for us to have things like differences in voltage and anything that you can then use to send signals. Because again, it would be completely irrelevant to try to transport ions across a membrane if the two sides were connected, right? Because it would equilibrate it anyway. So what is biogenesis of membrane proteins? I have to confess we are somewhat biased being in the department we're at. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, there is only one small question there. How, how does the DNA that is supposed to form a membrane protein find the translocons that are attached to the membranes? Because they're not translocons, ribosomes, I mean. Because there are ribosomes everywhere, right? So how do you find the right ribosome? They just find one and the ribosome bring it to the translocon. In general, we don't know. <laughs> uh, we don't know yet. Um, so many proteins, of course, th things that should be translocated and uh, moved to the inside of the cell, that's f quite fine. But some things should stay in the ER. So there, are, there have been some studies, and I should look this up because it might have, I don't think it has changed the last three or four years, but until a few years ago, we didn't know. And there was one argument that some of these some of the residues that are very hydrophobic are expressed by multiple codons. And there was an argument by a colleague of ours in Israel who argued that there is a imbalance in the codons so that it's more common. There are certain codons, in particular codons that have lots of uracil in it. And those codons would be overrepresented for membrane proteins. So his argument was actually it might actually be the RNA codons uh, that help you decide which ones target. But that's, I would, there was one bioinformatics side. I found it exceptionally interesting because it's such a crazy idea. And crazy ideas are very frequently wrong, but just occasionally they are also right. There are very few amazing ideas that turned out to be obvious from the start. They were frequently seen as crazy. So that it's a great research topic, but there is so much we don't know about signaling and targeting in cells. The other thing that the second those proteins have been uh, secreted and everything, why, how do we decide what proteins end up where? So what's a signal peptide? I know we didn't cover it yesterday. Right, well, that's the function, but what is it? So it's just it's a stretch of uh, amino acids at the start of a sequence, right? And they're usually hydrophobic. And it can be a pain to separate them from membrane proteins because they look just like membrane proteins. Mm -hmm. But they are frequently not quite hydrophobic enough to actually be inserted in the membrane. 
I think that was the biogenesis. Um, what sequences become membrane proteins? And you think this is easy, but it's not quite. We can take the obvious answer first, but it's not quite as easy as the obvious answer. So what is required for an alpha helix to end up in a membrane protein? So that's the obvious answer. They should be hydrophobic. But then, sorry, it wasn't yesterday, but the day before yesterday, we showed, I showed you all these S4 helices in the voltage-gated ion channels. So based on that definition, all of you would be dead. You would not have any voltage-gated channels. So obviously, that definition is not right. It's not, and it's not that I would mark you wrong at the exam if you said that they're hydrophobic. But my point here is that to every complicated answer, there, to every complicated question, there is a simple answer and it's wrong. <laughs> so it's not apparently just the hydrophobicity is not, of an individual helix is not enough to decide whether it goes into the membrane or not. So that the voltage sensors I showed you, they had four helices. And this was the fourth helix that was very charged even. It's not a coincidence that it's the fourth helix. Can you imagine any way the body, how the body does this? What do you think would be imagine, assuming that this was the first helix, that was the first segment, do you think that sensor could be a membrane protein? And you're quite right. So it's very important that it's the last and the fourth helix that can be a bit polar even charts. So if you look at this before, uh, what comes before, so the, uh, that helix had four or five, depending on how far down you go, four or five charges. The helix before that, S3, has two charges, negative ones instead of positive. And that's critical. So why does the fourth helix insert? It's more favorable to be inserted Well, no, not by itself, because we just said that, right? If this was the first helix, it would not insert. So it can interact with the third helix that is already there. But now I'm just moving between layers of turtles or something. Uh, so why is the third helix there? So nota bene, the third helix did not have as many charges. But it's still not good to have the third helix there. So what happens in these cases is that the first helix, the first segment has to be clearly hydrophobic. That is what drives insertion. And then they're connected, but that connection does not mean you can insert anything because it would just get stuck in the translocon or something. So what you can then do is that the second helix is probably also quite hydrophobic. I haven't checked this too specifically. Then the third helix, yes, technically it has those two charges, but apart from those two charges, it has a ton of very hydrophobic residues. So all those other hydrophobic residues will help pull in those two charges. And that we usually call that a marginally stable helix. So, it's, well, it's not really happy in the membrane, but it can push into the membrane if we absolutely force it. And now we have this surrounding with three helices, and in particular two negatively charged residues. And that gets the fourth helix in, even though the fourth helix in itself would not like to be there. So it's quite right that it's right in the sense that a membrane protein as a whole, the transmembrane domain, has to be hydrophobic but it has to be hydrophobic enough as a whole. We can allow individual helices towards the end of the sequences to break this pattern if they are stabilized by other more hydrophobic helices. Yeah. Uh, this is very main question because I don't know how this works, but do we know for sure that they inserted one by one and not in pairs? Ah, <coughs> no, we don't know. <laughs> uh, we have, it is widely believed, meaning that I and some other people think. Uh, <laughs> if you look at an individual translocon, there is not enough space there to have more than one alpha helix. And that would seem to answer your question. They have to be inserted one by one. But the problem is that if you look at many of these helices, the loops, let's see here. If we start to insert this helix first, if this is number one, and then number two, and then number three, and we're pushing it in that direction. So number, the first helix can go there easily, right? But the second helix, if we just push that in the same way, 
wait a second, that's not going to work, assuming that these are short loops. So you somehow would need to turn it around or insert those two helices as a pair or something. Uh, or imagine if you had a very long loop here, you could imagine that, well, then you would basically much insert helix 2 in the wrong way first and then have it turn around in a membrane. Can you imagine how expensive it would be, it would be to have a, a, an entire membrane protein turn around in a membrane? Is that going to happen? Uh, well, so full disclosure, if anybody had asked me that and I didn't know the answer, I would say obviously no, that can't happen. There appears to be proteins that can do it. It's very rare, but they can. We have no idea why. And we, have, we absolutely have no idea how it does it or why it's turning around. But there appears, under some conditions, some membrane proteins appear to be able to turn around in the membrane. I have no idea. Uh, or could you have maybe have a pair of translocons or something help create a larger channel or something? We don't know. So uh, this relates to another concept is that are these the entire topology and everything, is that decided co-translationally or post-translationally? Is it, are we inserting them and determining not just, are we inserting every helix exactly as it is being uh, translated or are we somehow first creating the helices, maybe inserting them in the wrong way and then fixing this up later? And the truth is that they're probably a bit of both. Um, and again, this is still very inconclusive results. They're exceptionally hard studies to make, but there are a couple of examples of both. So we know, we know, we know almost nothing about it. It's a great, it's a great topic, probably 10 PhD pieces. So we don't know. It's certainly not any question. We don't know. All we know is that there are, again, there are some examples in the literature where we can, where we know that if the way things would insert, uh, the protein would not work. And then you wait 10 minutes or something. We're talking about long times compared to molecular times. And then suddenly the protein works. So for whatever reason, the protein, something happened when it was in the membrane so that it fixed itself up. Likely that there were some helices turning around or something. And whether this is going to be the case in entire helices or are you going to have smaller reentrant segments? I think it's, I find this much easier to believe if you think about small reentrant segments that you probably saw in the bioinformatics course. So there are certainly some cases where you can insert a small segment by dipping down in an already existing protein, but we don't know. That's the answer. You have to do research on it if you want to find out. Yep. Regarding the third helix, say it's negative, is it possible for them to defer um, protonated? It is possible, yes. So remember what we spoke when we spoke about protonation? It's actually a surprisingly good question. Um, when we compared the positive and negative charges in membrane helices, which one was easier to insert? And why? Posi well, positive inside, that has to do with the location where we have the loops, right? Uh, and now we're talking about things inside. If you, if you absolutely have to insert charges into the membrane and you're not allowed to deprotonate them, would you try to insert something positive or negative? Do we have any other suggestions? <laughs> yeah. Why? So what did a lipid look like? Well, now most lipid, there are some charged ones, but they're mostly Switzer ionic. But slightly below the entire head group region, you had these carbonyl groups. And the carbonyl groups, uh -huh, I'm running out of. Let's draw a lipid here. So first you have some dipole up here, and then you have the long chains. And out roughly there, you have the carbonyl groups. So they're a bit down. And the carbonyl groups are characterized by being a carbon and then a double bond to an oxygen. And then they continue down with the chains. That oxygen is going to have what type of partial charge at least? Just like water, it's going to be slightly negative, right? So if you're a positively charged residue, you can interact with the carbonyl groups. While if you're negatively charged, you're going to you need to stretch all the way out to the phosphates, which is even further out. So you will end up distorting the membrane more with negative charges than positive ones. And you can actually see this pattern in bioinformatics. There is a strong pattern of the positive inside rule 
But if you try to, if you remove the systematic difference between inside and outside, you can definitely see there are very few charges in membrane proteins, but the positive ones are overrepresented. So what happens, in general, it's always going to be better to insert positive and negative ones. Um, the other alternative you mentioned is that you can deprotonate them. I would say, and again, this is recent. We did these calculations a few years ago. Positively charged residues, arginine and lysine, they're virtually always going to retain their charge so that they are protonated in the membrane. Negatively charged ones is 50-50. It's just borderline whether they deprotonate it or not. But that's not going to help you. Why? Otherwise, it's a great idea. Can't you just deprotonate them? They're no longer charged, and they're going to be advantages to insert. The point is that you're going to pay to deprotonate an aspartic acid or a glutamic acid. And you're going to pay in energy almost as much as it would cost to insert it in the membrane. So the only question, are you paying by deprotonating it, or are you paying by inserting it in the membrane? There is no such thing as a free lunch. We talked about translocons yesterday, too. That's a fun one. And also not quite as easy as it might look. Here's another question where I would suggest to break it down if you find it difficult. So where is it sitting and deciding that? It's a, it's a membrane protein. That's pretty much it's a helix channel, roughly, right? We don't call it a helix channel. But it's a membrane protein that sits right in the middle and helps things insert. So how does it alter the free energies? It doesn't. It makes the barrier lower, so it's faster, but the free energy is still the same. So you answered the question completely correctly, but your first state, and because of your correct answer, your first statement was incorrect. So let's say... <laughs> And it's, it's a great illustration because I wanted you to fall in that trap. Uh, the mistake you did do is that you did not break it down. You tried to answer it immediately and then you rushed over it. So what is the first thing you said after that you said that it doesn't alter the free energy? You said that it, it lowers the barriers. The last time I checked, that's a free energy. So it does alter it. But the point is that there are many things here, right? I'm going to need to go and get a... If you start out here and then there's a barrier and insertion, right? Anytime I ask you about a free energy, draw a curve like that. So you know what free energies, there are at least three, en three, three energies involved here. So you have one, two, and three. And what you meant by your first answer is that it does not alter the free energy difference between state one and state three. And that's quite correct. But it does change the transition state. So it does change the barrier, but it does not change the difference between one and three. So again, don't move too fast. Break it down into pieces so you realize what question you're answering first. Number seven and eight aren't so much questions. Uh, it was not a coincidence. Again, full disclosure, these are pet projects of mine. We love them. Um, but they're not just random channels. They're fundamental, important building blocks in your nervous system. And voltage channels conduct electrical nerve signals. And by that conduction, where are they conducting that type of nerve signals? Membrane. Well, but, but all cells have membrane. Uh, the body is conducting it inside a cell, right? Along a cell. Uh, and again, nerve cells, in contrast to all other cells, have very large physical extents. So they conduct it inside the cell. Uh, Voltage-gated channels actually occur in, this is a super cool concept, actually, the whole concept of excitability. 
that you could take a cell and somehow put it in an electrically active state. Which of course is a signal we see in the EKG and everything, but it's everywhere. It's in your nerve it's in the peripheral nerve system, it's in your central nerve system, your brain. Uh, actually, uh, the reason why we all exist is that when a uh, sperm fertilizes an egg, it's the voltage-gated channels that, then, uh, that help close the egg so that other sperm don't come in, so we wouldn't exist without them. Uh, all your heart beats, voltage-gated ion channels. Ligand-gated channels, on the other hand, they mediate these... <coughs> Sorry, the ligand-gated channels mediate the nerve signals that we cause by the excitability, but they move between cells. So when you release something that by sensing this uptake, we can cause a new nerve signal in the next, next cell. And I, I, I might have touched upon that briefly on Tuesday, but uh, can you imagine why, why people are so fascinated by ligand-gated ion channels nowadays and why they become so hot? They're outstanding drug charts. So there's an entire new field, uh, well new, it's not that new anymore, we call it neuropharmacology. They're basically specifically developing drugs to tune your nervous system. Because until even roughly when I, when I was in school, right, the nervous system was just one big, big, big black box, the brain and everything. We have no idea about brain. And many of the diseases that we tend to treat with psychiatry and everything, there are of course disorders. So just a way that Right now, we're pretty good at fixing you up with antibiotics or something if you have an infection. A whole lot of the diseases that we, there are of course psychiatric diseases and everything, and then we, but we don't have any good ways of treating them. And I bet give this two more decades, the vast majority of psychiatric diseases, we will be able to go in, find mutation differences, correct uh, levels of uh, neurotransmitters or whatever it might be. The difficulty here is that traditionally we try to design drugs by just shutting processes off. And that's not going to work here because if you start shutting off nerve signals, bad things will happen. So the hard thing is that we're going to need to find ways to tune nerve signaling. I didn't mention this either, but uh, so one of the reasons why my colleagues of mine uh, are super interested in ligand-gated ion channels is that they're working on anest better anesthetics. And I did mention that anesthesia is important. Uh, but why do you need better anesthetics? There are tons of them. So we don't really need better anesthetics for you. We can't take any of you and go and sedate you. Well, <laughs> I shouldn't, but... Um, the problem is that anesthesia is a pretty rough process on the body. So that you're sedating a patient, uh, but this completely disrupts all the signaling in lots of places you didn't intend to uh, disrupt it to. Uh, so what suddenly happens is that as the patient is lying on the table, suddenly the blood pressure goes up. And it's actually it's not enough with anesthesia because you also want to make sure that the patient should not feel anything. You want to relax the muscles because if the muscles are not relaxed, it's very difficult to cut in them. Uh, and you want to make sure that at least during, you never, you want to make sure that the proteins is amnesiac, that is they should not remember anything from the procedure. Um, so suddenly we're talking about a cocktail of three or four drugs. This still works great with you, no problem, whatever. We give you 50% extra of the drugs. Um, but then suddenly you have a severely obese 80-year-old patient. A problem with blood pressure. This starts to get complicated. Or if you have a surgeon and say uh, you have patients in um, the army, um, if you have patients who are severely wounded or something, they've lost a lot of blood, and you're now also going to sedate them doing this fairly rough process and this body has just lost half its blood. Those patients don't wake up again. And it's, this is difficult enough that even for completely normal healthy patients, it's happened roughly once in a thousand or so that you have a bad response to the anesthesia and the patient dies. Happened a few years ago, even at Stanford where my colleagues are, there was some sort of TV show anchor that went in to do a standard procedure and he died on the operating table. Bad things happen. So again, so my colleague here, who is actually is, uh, working in the OR and sedating people three days a week, he, said he would never have voluntary surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah, things can go bad. And the other, the pro so what the problem that happens is that what the, uh, this is why, why you actually have an anesthesiologist, a special doctor just sedating the patient. So what happens is that this doctor realizes that your blood pressure is going down. But that's not that bad because we have drugs to keep your blood pressure up. So that means that we now give you a fifth drug. 
but the uh, drug that kept your blood pressure up had some other problem. I don't know, I'm, I'm not an MD, but... <laughs> and then you give you a sixth drug. So this works when you are in the operating room, and then we pull you out to recovery. And then you now have six drugs that are all balancing things, and they're all wearing off with different rates. So people frequently die, in, well, not frequently, but uh, some of these deaths actually happen in recovery. Because suddenly the drug that kept your blood pressure up wore off faster than the one that depressed your blood pressure. So one of the reasons what we would like with this, we would like drugs that are, ideally you would like a drug that's tunable. Um, rather than having drugs that fall off in 15 minutes, imagine if you could have a drug and a counter drug um, so that you can specifically decide, oh, the blood, I want to sedate this patient 5% deeper, like a dial. And then it's a little bit, uh, the breathing is starting to go down here, so let's reduce the level of anesthesia by 5%. And I can't do that if you're about to die. I can't reduce it and say, well, the patient is going to start breathing in 15 minutes. No, in 15 minutes the patient will be dead. So I think there's a lot of interest in finding drugs that we can use, that we can fine tune, where there are fewer side effects and everything, so that we can perform surgeries on more and more elderly people. And this actually works. Um, it's one of the reasons for all these new anesthetics. So today we, uh, so today we don't hesitate to perform surgery on a 90-year-old. You would never have done that a generation ago. But they're important. Um, they're also super important for lots of drug abuse. Um, P-type ATPases, uh, they're important in a whole lot of physiological processes, in particular one. So what do they do? The main function of it. There are, this is an entire class of proteins too, whether we spoke specifically about one. Transport things against the gradient. Mm, what thing? Ions. ions. What ions? Protons. No. So that given the name, you can probably already get that this is the one that used ATP for the transport. But there's a very common one. What did we call it? If you know the name, you're going to know what it transports. NAK and sodium <coughs> and potassium. So sodium potassium ATPase, which is the big, you could almost engine in your body. This is the one that creates the imbalance in ions that creates the nerve potential everywhere. That is what keep our entire nervous system going. We have a gigantic group out at Cyrap Lab, if you're interested in this, working with super resolution microscopy, uh, where they can actually get resolution down to 10 nanometers so we can see where in your nerve cells are specific individual copies of these molecules located in live cells and also see how the transport works and everything. It's super cool. Mm -hmm. So I could ask you, so what is, explain the role of voltage and ligand heated ion channels. Because you know, they have these distinct roles. One, one is responsible for the signaling inside cells, and the other one is responsible for the signaling between cells. And that is, I also think it's a beautiful example of how evolution has worked. Because again, it, if you th the more you think about it, that between cells you're going to need some sort of chemical signaling. Inside cells, chemical signaling is really inefficient. It's much more efficient to do with electrical signaling. So I spoke a little bit about anesthesia above, um, but this is another trick question. We have no idea really how anesthetics work. All right, we know nowadays that they bind to the specific binding site as allosteric modulators in these channels that I showed you, but we don't know what it is that makes you go unconscious. Another great research topic for P, but well not just one, 10, ten PhD thesis. Yep. So they bind to the um, ligand gate Not just bind, so that they do, but uh, so the, let's get things right here. So the ligand gate that ion channels, the, f the fundamental way they work is that they have one extracellular domain, so a domain on the outside of the cell even, where you have the neurotransmitters binding. And when these neurotransmitters bind, they will cause almost an earthquake in the entire protein and eventually open up the pore, the channel in the transmembrane domain. And then, you affect it, and then the ion channel starts to conduct ions. 
both anesthesia, all these drug abuses and everything, they bind to the same channels, but they don't bind to that primary, the normal binding site. Um, you, you typically call it, you occasionally call it the agonist binding site. But they bind, there is some sort of secondary binding site, which we nowadays, we tend to call these allosteric binding sites. No matter how much anesthesia or alcohol or something you bind, the channel will not open, period. So it can't open the channel. And that's, I think that was one of the reasons why it took us so long to understand how they work. Because the obvious thing that, the ob my obvious would guess should have been that it binds to the same thing and opens the channel, right? They don't. But they kind of act like a lubricant. So that if you have the anesthetic bound, the channel responds much more quicker and to much lower levels of the agonist, the normal ligands, the neurotransmitters. So it's somehow, um, it usually primes the channel, it makes the channel more receptive to them. For some anesthetics. Other molecules close the channel. Remember this thing I said about the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde attitude of these channels? They are complicated, it's not just one channel. It turns out even the GABA channel, so there, I, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more about when we talk about our research later on in the course. It's a small channel with five different subunits. There are, and the, now we're not talking about all the channels, just one, the GABA channel. There are 17 different genes in your brain for these subunits. So just the GABA channels, it's 17 to the power of five different ways you can assemble these channels. And we know very well, we know that some of them are, only some of them are sensitive to anesthetics and everything. But this is likely the reason for all diversity in your brain, why we have different types of nerve cells in parts of the brain in the central versus peripheral nervous system. We know surprisingly little about it. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about our research towards the end of the course. Uh, but the point is that both anesthesia and all these things, it's an allosteric process. So you have a small secondary molecule that changes the way the normal molecular binding works, or at least the effect of the molecular binding, which is super important and common in biology. We're going to talk more about it later today. I did not tell you about how long it takes for things, well, indirectly with it, but um, I'll be a bit nasty. Try to answer these. Even if you don't remember it, try to reason what times it we must be talking about. Uh, don't just say a number. Try an argument why you think it happens on that time scale. Only a few hundred microseconds. For which one? So number 12 then, yeah, I think you're in the right ballpark. Well, why would you say 200 microseconds? <laughs> I don't know, it's just yesterday that you showed us the, the, the movie. Yeah, okay. It's that, that. It's <laughs> no, but, but that, actually, yes, uh, actually it's a super good answer because that's, this is of course how I reason about these things too, right? I compare them to other things I know. Um, so an upper limit here could somehow be the time it would take to fold the normal protein. This is a smaller transition, and it needs to happen quicker. It can't take a second. Why? What would happen if it took a second for a channel to gate? Yeah, it would take like half an hour to move a finger. So that obviously it has to be way faster than a second for these things to happen. And you can say that even without knowing anything about structure. Good. So we have some sort of upper limit. And then if you reason a bit more, there are going to be tens of thousands of channels that need to open on the way down. So this can happen in 0.1 second or something. We need to be talking about things that are way faster than milliseconds. So a few uh, hundreds of microseconds, I think, is a great estimate. But it's also, it has to be s slower than, say, just adding some more residue into an alpha helix or something, right? If you think about the time it takes for an individual ion to go through a channel. Can you reason like looking at the, um, at the um, um, potential number of potential? 
no, actually, I, actually, you could, you could, you could, you could calculate the acceleration and everything. Uh, I'll spill the bit. It's think ten nanoseconds. It's an exceptionally fast process. Um, and I guess you could compare it to say that adding one more turn in an alpha helix or something, but it's the charge. The reason to mention this is that membrane proteins and in particular ion channels, they are so insanely efficient that to an ion, to the right type of ion, it just looks almost like a hole. There's nothing whatsoever that stops it. It goes through with perfect like billions of ions per second. Remember at the beginning of the course that I also talked about this difference between sodium and potassium? The reason why this is so amazing because it also, to the right ion, the smaller one, sorry, the to the right ion, uh, the larger one, it's just a hole. We don't even, there's no speed bump even. To the wrong ion, it, does, it never goes through, not even once per second. So it has an insane efficiency, it has an insane efficiency in terms of the speed by which it conducts ions combined with an even more insane efficiency that it never ever does a mistake. And you're doing this with something that's a bold spark of 20 alpha helices or so. I have hmm? question 12, gate, is that open or closed? Oh sorry, um, exactly, open or closed. So gate, no, as a gating, um, because if you mean opening, you mean opening, right? Closing, you mean closing. And if you want to talk about the process where an ion channel either opens or closes, that it changes from one state to the other, we're using that word for it. Uh, so that, which is much easier to say than open or close all the time. Yeah. So channel gating is the process when it's changing between those two states. So how long does a larger structural transition in a membrane protein possibly take then? Number 12, so we said ballpark of 200 microseconds or something. But again, we're within an order of magnitude. Uh, because it was significant, if you started to go up to the level of several mi milliseconds, right? Our, my reaction time is maybe in the ballpark of, uh, well, uh, 0.1 or 0.05 seconds or something, depending on whether I need to do it voluntarily or not. So that it has to be, individual channels has to open hundreds of times or even a thousand times faster than that. So ballpark of hundreds of microseconds. But, it, but no, it isn't exact. Uh, there, are, there are some channels that will gate in, the fastest ones here might very well gate in 20 to 50 microseconds. There will likely be some other ones that take a millisecond. So there, there isn't a unique number, and in many cases we don't know. It will vary from channel to channel. So then there's, how else are there questions? Uh, what should know about it? So the main point of these questions is to learn you to uh, teach you to reason about it. To realize what is reasonable and what is not reasonable. The point is not that it's 200 instead of 500. 500 might very well be a better number. I don't care. Because the point is it's not one second and it's not a nanosecond. And the time you start there, you can start to use this forking down so that you have a rough idea whether the process can be important or not. And if you think about it, it's roughly the same reasoning we argued when we talked about Gibbs versus Helmholtz free energies, right? That, you know, what in practice, the pressure and volume fluctuations are not going to be important for proteins. I never calculated that. You didn't calculate it either, I think. But we just said, you know what, compared, yes, you're right, there are going to be th six orders of difference magnitude that there is no point of even bothering about it. So it's important to have this gut feeling about different concepts. So all I'm asking for, have a gut feeling about these things. You can be, I would never, I would never say that you're wrong even if you were an order of magnitude off. But if you say that it takes 10 seconds for a single ion to go through a channel, it's not going to work. So number 13 is a bit related to the things we talked about here. How long does an even larger structural transition, so sort of transition that would involve the entire protein take? I even said it earlier today. You can be talking about 10 minutes, even more. It can be exceptionally slow. And compare this to the beta sheets that we talked about before. This means that there must be some gigantic energy barriers involved, such as the energy barriers if we need to move things into membranes and everything. And I'm sorry that it sounds like hand waving. The reason is that it is hand waving. We don't know that much about it yet. It's science, the research front. 
We spoke a little bit about these different models. Um, what is the fluid mosaic model? Mm -hmm. And with the fluid part in particular. It's like liquid. Yes. And it's, it's actually, it's, it's a better answer than you think. Again, it is, this really is a two-dimensional liquid. It's completely fluid. There is no rigidity whatsoever. Uh, things move, they, the membrane proteins will literally diffuse around. And you can actually track this with this super resolution uh, experience I talked about. You will see that the ion channels or the pumps in that case are actually diffusing along the membrane as a function of time. So, it's fluid so the, the fluidity here is, comes from the lipids. So that the lipids, the, uh, the lipids are amphiphilic, meaning that you have one hydrophilic part facing the water and then you have the hydrophobic tails facing each other. So all, just the lipid bilayer itself will actually be in what you call a liquid crystalline phase, but that's not part of the course. Um, so you will, affect, you will have a two-dimensional liquid. Things are completely free, just as their molecules are free to move around in water. Lipids are completely free to move around, but they can only move around in the bilayer. They can't move out of the bilayer. So in fact, you have a two-dimensional liquid. And, but then, of course, we start to assemble things into this cell. You might you have membrane proteins, uh, you might have some sugars, cholesterol and other things. Some of those molecules might even bind a bit to each other or interact. So that you end up with this mosaic of lots of different regions in the cell. But, but again, if you were to look at this in a super resolution microscope, it would move around. And today this might seem obvious with the computer simulations and we have, but this was so not obvious in the 1970s. Another alternative you could have imagined is that couldn't membranes be completely rigid? Most other things in our cells, and protein, well, proteins are rigid, bone is rigid, collagen is rigid. If you had to take a bet, uh, saying that, oh, you somehow fold the entire membrane into a specific structure, and then all the proteins sit exactly in place. And this is the, both a curse and blessing. It's a blessing because you're, it, things need to work that way. It's a curse because this makes it very difficult to study membranes. You can't really, you can't image membranes live because there is no average structure in the membrane. And again, if you want to, not that you don't need to know it, but there is another, this other name. If you hear about the Singer-Nicholson model, that's the fluid mosaic model, the guys behind it. And then we had the other model called the Popo-Engelmann model, which also had another name. And the reason why I say Popo-Engelmann is because if I tell you the other name, it's going to be so much more obvious what it does. What was that other name? No guesses? Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember what the name was? Two stage. two stage. If you don't remember anything else, remember that Popo Engelmann correspond to two stage model. And if you do that, you will likely ring a bell and realize it was the part that, ah, you first insert and then you find each other. Is that model true based on what we talked about this morning? Not really, right? It's not, there are exceptions to it. There are things that are, in some cases, there are helices that, that need to find each other. That S4 helix obviously could not insert if it had to insert completely isolated first. And this is, of course, the reason why people spend so much time finding the exceptions to the model. That is not just, it's not strictly true that things insert completely independently and find each other. But I think it's a, the point of models is not that they should be exact and accurate. The point of models is that it provides a conceptual way of describing things that helps us understand it. And I think the, the Popo-Engelmann model is it, it's outstanding in the sense that it is roughly correct, but the point is there are exceptions to it. And that gives us a 16. How are pumps different from channels? Hmm? The channels are simple, boring. They're just holes in the membrane. They, 
in so many channels actually you of course have these holes are selective so they only let through one type of uh, ion but in general the an ion can never uh, sorry a channel can never ever transport anything against a gradient in concentration or voltage whatever it may be it can only channels can only help equalize things I already went through the outline that we're going to talk about today, uh, so let's jump straight into it. We spoke about the fold universe a little bit uh, on uh, Tuesday, and uh, in particular this classical quote from Cyrus Shotia, a thousand folds for the molecular biologists, which sounds so much better than 1,500 folds for the molecular biologists. And as we already said, that if you think that there are a few genes in your genome, 20,000, this number is insane. Well, they're not, they're not identical structures, right? But there are only in the ballpark of 1,000 different ways to fold all the proteins in your body. Or the Norwegian spruce. And in being able to sustain these complicated life processes with such a small number of folds, it's... I would never have guessed. So that the complicated question that we end up with that we didn't really answer on Tuesday, that on Tuesday we just observed this, but this means that there appears to be, there is a, we know that there is a huge diversity in sequences. And for some reason, all these sequences end up forming just a handful of folds, if you have fairly large hands at least. Um, and we don't know that. Or rather, we know that it happens, but we don't know why. Uh, as we saw yesterday, that there are a handful of typical folds. Um, these four helix bundles was one of them. And I think the book likes to talk about this 20-80 rule, which actually I think is quite good, that 20% of folds account for 80% of the proteins. So if you think 1,500 was low, we're talking about two, 300 folds that describe almost everything. So now we're down to 300 different ways to fold all the amino acids in your bodies to create you. Uh, this is mostly true for your RNA. There are a bunch of folds for RNA. DNA, in contrast, DNA, actually, depending on how you count it, DNA has one or three folds. There are A, B, and Z forms of DNA. So for DNA, there is only one stable structure. And now we could argue that there are three possible answers to this question. This could be caused by evolutionary divergence. That is, maybe it was the case that all those, if you pick a fold, the globin fold, maybe it is the case that every single protein that has a globin fold was at one point in time related. So that all the hundreds of proteins in your body that they have the globin fold, their sequence, their sequence identity might be so extremely low nowadays that you can't even identify that they are related anymore. But at one point in time, they must have been related. And that is the reason they had that fold. So they, they have diverged so much that you can't even say that they're related anymore. But at one point in time, they must have been related. You could also say that it's some sort of functional convergence, that that globin fold is so awesome. Or maybe the fatty acid binding protein is probably a better example. If you have this small pocket that you want it to be hydrophobic on the inside and hydrophilic on the outside, it's so obvious to just do that with two beta sheets. You can't, nature favors simplicity, right? And there aren't that many simple folds. So maybe evolution has converged, though the sequences came from completely different, uh, well, the sequences were completely different from the start, not evolutionary related, but they somehow gradually converged to the most efficient folds from instance of function. And the third possibility you can imagine that maybe, just maybe, maybe there aren't that many ways to fold the protein. There are some folds that are better than others. So what do you think is true of these three? All of them to some extent. Um, I would argue, we obviously know that there is a lot of evolutionary relationships in cells. So there are going to be tons of proteins that are evolutionary. There are definitely cases, I think ion channel is the obvious example, that if you're going to need, if you need to push ions through a membrane, you're going to need to create a hole that is hi more hydrophilic on the inside so that we shield the ions from the hydrophobic environment. And I'm not, the amount of imagination we can have there is limited. There has to be a hole in the middle and there has to be something around it. 
But what we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about is this third one. Um, there are surprisingly few different folds that will create stable proteins, which is intimately related to the role of mutations and other things that we're going to see later and why proteins form the folds they do. Did you talk about fold patterns in the bioinformatics course? I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about it. So some already in the late 70s or early 80s, when we get it, started to get more and more structures, we realized at some point we, we want to classify these structures. And we somehow want to say that all the globin folds are obviously the same. And then at some level, we want to be able to say that, well, do you have some class of parallel beta sheets versus orthogonal beta sheets or something? There is no sequence identity whatsoever, but if you just look at these proteins, we want to be able to classify them. Um, and there aren't that many. We also talked about mixed alpha slash beta or alpha plus beta proteins, tin barrels, etc. And you can dig this down as much as you want. So there are a bunch of ways you could imagine classifying this. There are, if there are a bunch of ways to do things, scientists will not agree on one way of doing it. Um, people are going to find a few alternatives. There are two databases yet that you might want to hear of. One of them is called SCOP, and there's, it's even SCOP2 nowadays, and the other one is called CAT. And again, you don't, this is more bioinformatics. I'm not going to ask you specific details about the databases. The reason though why these are different is that CAT is very much an aut mostly automatic classification. We try to let a computer classify proteins which is awesome in particular today when you have 130,000 structures, you, can, you need computers to do this. And for as I was saying, whether your beta sheets are parallel or anti-parallel, whether it's alpha and beta or just alpha or just beta, if I have the structure, you could probably write a program to do this. And, and then of course, there will be some more difficult things, but so you'd have some sort of very large class, which is just alpha or beta or alpha and beta. And then sorts of large architectures that corresponds roughly to the examples I've been showing you. And then there's going to be the topology which describes what is the exact number of sheets and helices you have. And on the lowest level is going to be the homology, which is what you've done in the bioinformatics course. But on the class, we, they don't need to share any sequence identity whatsoever. So these are descriptions of what the proteins look like, the shape, not the amino acids. Scope, on the other hand, is the opposite. It's a database where people sit and look at proteins in a browser. It's completely insane. Alexei Mertzen spent a few decades of his life doing this, but as good as computers are, computers will not be as good as a really good scientist. And Alexei is an, was an outstanding X-ray crystallographer when he did this, so while it might sound bad to do this with humans, if you're interested in biology, if you're interested in just doing statistics and everything, CAT is fine. But if you're really interested in using this for biological conclusions and everything, SCOP is amazing. Because th there are, of course, examples that they appear to break the pattern. But if you know enough about the biology and if you read all the scientific papers about this protein, you actually know that it belongs better in that class. And it's just a freak of nature why it had that extra alpha helix on the outside. So yes, it has an alpha helix, but we should still classify it as an all beta protein because that is the family it really belongs in. Um, so I love to use SCOP, uh, but I, Alexi has gradually pushed this over to others. So SCOP came from the Cambridge group where Cyrus Schottia was too. And it's, uh, it's definitely worth browsing around and looking at these databases. Um, yep. Are those Sorry, those? <laughs> yes. No, I think that they faked this a bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, I think, no, they might very well be. They might very well be. I've never thought about that. Uh, they probably are real structures. They probably are real. But of course, shown from the right way. And then I bet that they cut off the domain <laughs> if this was larger. They are right, but that's a, because that's a tin barrel, right? That's probably, this is a dimer they've used to make sure that it looks like an S. They might have faked the dimer, that I don't know. Uh, but they're real structures. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that's going to happen and why these databases are important that structures undergo evolution too. Or of course it's not the structure that undergoes evolution, it's your sequence, it's your genome that undergoes evolution. But evolution happens because of what? So what was the central dogma? So where is evolution in this picture? 
So this point here, this is evolution, which is important. Or actually, it's not so much evolution, it's rather natural selection, right? And there are a bunch of cool examples here. Llama hemoglobin binds oxygen ho harder than pony or horse hemoglobin. Why? And what difference does that make? You have less oxygen, which means that you have lower oxygen pressure. So that, and at that altitude, it helps you to bind it harder. But shouldn't it always be good to bind oxygen harder? Why don't all, all organisms do that? Right, because you're also going to release the myoglobin. So the equilibrium for a llama is different than it is for most horses. But nature has adapted. Fetal hemoglobin is different from adult hemoglobin. Why? No, but you don't, you can use, you, well, so in that case, but that case, well, why on earth would you even have hemoglobin in the first place in a fetus? Sorry? And where does he get his oxygen? Maybe the, the concentration or the pressure on the oxygen is higher. So that it needs to steal the oxygen from the mother. So that this, uh, the, the fetal hemoglobin needs to have a much higher affinity of oxygen so that it can steal it. So they, they don't necessarily mix the blood, right? But through the placenta and everything. So you need to have an oxygen that is adapted to steal the oxygen from the mother so that the fetus get it. And of course, but the second you're born, these genes tend to be shut off. You don't need them anymore. And it would be inefficient to have it. The other thing that we appear to see is, and, I, and I, we showed you, I showed you some examples about that on Tuesday, that eukaryotic, and in particular vertebrate proteins, they are more complicated than prokaryotic ones. Those ion channels, for instance, the first ion channels uh, that people determine were prokaryotes. Uh, and in prokaryotes, you don't have voltage. You don't have cell nerve signaling. So, but you have exactly the same type, almost the same type of potassium channels in uh, bacteria. But in bacteria, they're controlled by pH. So just change the pH and they will open or close. And then in a human, and they, they consist of four small domains. So, and what then has happened, in it, and that's pretty much three helices per domain. What then has happened in a human is that you've added an ent entirely separate unit, that is the voltage-gated unit. But the central part of the channel is exactly the same in bacteria. But this extra unit means now that in humans we can control this with voltage across the membrane. So that humans frequently do more advanced, or vertebrates in general, do more advanced and complicated functionality. And it's, I wouldn't say that it never happens, but it's rarer with multi-domain proteins in bacteria. So can you imagine why bacteria don't like these advanced proteins? Wouldn't bacteria want to be like us? So the point is that it's, yes, the, the point is that we are, we are the inefficient organism uh, and they are the efficient organism. Because a, a bacterium that would require seconds for a process to happen, they're going to need to go through a generation in 15 minutes. They can't afford it. So bacteria, I would say they're, in many ways, they're the pinnacle of evolution because anything that is not super efficient has been killed by natural selection. And that's also why they have exceptionally small genomes, just a few thousand genes. You only have the genes that you absolutely need for the bacterium to survive. So that anything, any advanced things like this, right, there is no way bacteria would ever have it. <coughs> so that the overall patterns of these things that, as I mentioned with the, with the ion channels, right, that Human and we, can, we frequently use the bacterial ones as model organisms, but there is more embroidery in human proteins. Human proteins are frequently less stable. Um, we don't really know why that one. Uh, it's harder, it's always harder to work with human ones. I even think, oh yes, sorry, I even had an image of this. Bacterial channel, and it's bad because I should, uh, ah, the coloring is rough here. Sorry about that. But do you, see, do you see here the central pore here and even those loops there? It's exactly the same gating mechanism there. And the fact that you have this helices tilting here, it's exactly the same way the helices are placed here. But then this domain then has this part added too, and that domain has that part added. And these are the voltage sensors that instead help push it open. It's a very common difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. How fast do you think this happens? Hmm? Of structures. How long do you think it would take for 
a protein to evolve a new functionality. Yeah, well, they're the same function in the sense that everything depends on what you mean by function. It's the same function in the sense that they both conduct potassium channels. This one gates by controlling the pH. That one gates by changing the voltage. This one is not sensitive to voltage change. So function, yes, they're all the same. The effect is the same, but they're controlled in different ways. But take a guess. If you would imagine that we had high pressure. How fast could things happen? Uh, yeah, uh, remove the million part. Um, it was a really cool paper seven years ago now in science. Uh, it's Tom Cod in the Atlantic. And if, apparently, if you live very close to the Hudson River, the level of PCB in the Hudson River is insane. Don't eat fish from the Hudson River. And it's just basically in a few generations, uh, they, and they, can, they can actually trace this, that based on where they fished the cod, there are certain genes that have been changed. So that Tom Cod living here, they developed new genes here so that the proteins are resistant to the PCBs. Um, it's basically environmental uh, uh, tox toxic chemicals in the environment. It's basically uh, pollution by humans. And you can specifically see the alleles and everything. Uh, super cool study. I uploaded a copy. It's not really... The evolutionary study is a bit off uh, from this course. I don't expect you to read the entire paper. But if you want to read it, it's present on the website. But how, how did they, they uh, refine that investigation? Oh, that's good. Yeah. It was a while since I got to read that. I think they're comparing this to uh, older samples of the fish or something. Um, but the point is that this can happen super fast. And that, well, the, the other obvious thing with the timeline, right? when, we, when did we start releasing PCBs? Yeah. It was not a million years ago. <laughs> It was in the 50s. Yep. But is this a completely new mutation? Hmm? Or is you have allele frequencies which is not quite the same as developing a completely new function? Well, it's, it's not really a new function, right? But it's just that it's not that we've de developed completely new proteins, but that we have adapted the protein's functionality. And I don't know what specific functionality PCB would have on these proteins. Uh, but for whatever reason, the nature has evo evolved the functionality a bit so that we're no longer as sensitive to PCBs. And that can happen in a few decades. But this, of course, is an example where the evolutionary pressure must have been insanely high around here, right? That you can't, it was likely so polluted that fish couldn't even live there. And another example where you see this is actually around the Chernobyl uh, reactor in Ukraine. Animals have caused me created mutations so they can withstand radioactivity. So that we are occasionally, I guess the negative way of looking at the world is that the human, humans polluting the world is at the end of nature. Nature is pretty good at adapting. Doesn't necessarily mean that we will be around, uh, but nature will likely be around. Uh, but so that the only thing we're going to create is that we might kill off the humans, but nature will survive. But if we go back to this thing that if there is some sort of structural evolution here, um, or that we say that there are a handful of structures that are better in some sense than others, why are those better? And what we said, all the, I think it was already the first week, we argued for the importance of hydrogen bonds, right? So having lots of hydrogen bonds is good. Um, and that means that to create lots of hydrogen bonds, we can't really put a whole lot of loops or coil in the inside. Because if we started putting those loops on the inside, we would not have all the beautifully paired alpha helices and beta sheets. So even, even when we start doing things there, floppy things that can form a lot of good hydrogen bonds or secondary structure, we have to place them on the outside. So then the cores need to be regular alpha helices and beta sheets. And already there, we've started to discard an insanely large fraction of all the proteins you could have, right? They have to be regular in the inside and loops on the outside. Uh, the edges of, in particular, beta sheets, but also the ends of helices must fade with water. Roughly for the argument I made about the membrane proteins, that at the edge of the alpha helix, the hydrogen bonds, well, the peptide uh, groups, that means that the hydrogen bonds are not as paired. At the edge of the beta sheet, if this beta sheet did not face water there, well, all these unpaired hydrogen bonds there then would be placed in right in the middle of a protein and would be astronomically expensive. So now we've also said that we can't just take a beta sheet 
neither the loops can't really be on the surface either. The ends of things also have to be on the surface. And that means that it's going to be much more difficult for us to create something very large, because if we created a very large proteins, we would have too many of these edges on the inside of the proteins. So we're just, as we're talking here, we're seeing the number of possible folds just <coughs> dropping away. Helix and sheet regions must be separate might be a strong word, but if you look about these classifications where we mix them, right, there are ways of mixing helices and sheets. Do you remember one of them? There were two common folds. Rossmann. Sorry? Rossmann. Rossmann was one of them and the other one was? Uh, Tim Barrel. Tim Barrel. And are, but are they, if you really look at those folds, so if in sequence wise, I buy it. Helices and sheets are mixed, they're perfectly mixed. But if you look at the actual structure, are they mixed? Because there's a Rossmann fold here, right? That the entire sheet is one sheet, and then the helix one region there, and the helix are one region there. So even in these structures that mix them perfectly, the secondary structure things are still discrete. So that in practice, the helix and sheet regions are largely separate. And then there are even fewer ways we can combine them, because if you now have a small structure, and if you have one sheet region and two helix regions, yeah, that's, you, can have the, you can have helix, helix, sheet, or helix, sheet, helix. And that's pretty much it. And then you can choose a little bit how you orient it, orthogonal or parallel. And somewhere, there my, somewhere around there, my imagination runs out. You could probably find something with a loop or something. But the point is that even with something fairly large like this, there aren't that many. Uh, sorry, the reason why this is a bit large, this is also a dimer. So if you cut this in half, there aren't really that many ways to organize it. And what this somehow hints is that any, if you, th these are, they're rules, but they're not hard laws. So there are exceptions. But the point is that any time you make one of these exceptions, you're going to be paying. And you can, of course, afford to pay now and then. But you can't always pay for all four of them. So in general, exceptions, anything that, so-called defects that violate these laws are going to be costly. And what does nature think about things that costs? It's bad, right? Because if you now have a protein that has this cost, say that an edge inside a protein, and then one of your offspring suddenly has the reverse where they put it on the inside, that is going to be a more efficient protein. It will cost less energy to fold it. It's going to have an evolutionary advantage, and it will change. It might not be an insane evolutionary pressure, so it might take a million years, but eventually it will change. So we already spoke a little bit about these layers. The problem with one single layer, it's by far the most simple structure you can imagine, but you can't really do anything with it, right? One floppy beta sheet. The first thing is that it's going to be floppy, like a piece of paper. And the same thing is, I'm not sure whether you saw the news the other day. That was Scott Pruitt of the EPA. He had asked to get the $70,000 bulletproof desk. It was apparently rejected. And then people are making jokes about this because a bulletproof desk doesn't really help you a whole lot because you can just move or go around the desk and shoot the guy instead. <laughs> and it's the same problem here, right? One layer, yes, well, what, what are you going to do with this layer? You can't separate anything from anything else because you can just diffuse to the other side. Uh, two layers, we're in nirvana. This is the fatty acid binding proteins, the smallest things you can imagine. They're great for shielding. It is also small and efficient. And while I said beta sheet here, it doesn't say sheet, it said layer. You can, they have, the myoglobin fold, the globin fold is almost like this, right? You have one small cavity, one small hole in the inside where you bind the protoporphyrin group, the heme group, and then an outside. So if you want to keep things simple, stay there. Three layers, well, that would be the Rossmann folds, right? And there are cases where you could have those two cavities. If you need more than one binding site, Technically, you could have two proteins like that, but if you need lots of these, well, having something with two cavities is efficient and good. So you will definitely see these two. Four layers. Oh, my God. Now it starts to get complicated. You don't... Now you're going to start to... You need to bury some hydrophilic amino acids here, because if everything was hydrophobic, they would not be stable and everything. Uh, I can't immediately think of any 
protein that has four layers. They do exist, but it's, and the reason that, that I can't think of it is, of course, a good indication. There is no obvious reason why you would absolutely need four layers, that you can't do with two or three at least. So that's going to be complicated to create. You need a very special composition of amino acids. Five layers, forget about it. I will eat my left shoe if you can find a five layer protein. Don't take that as a challenge because I, I bet there is an exception. I bet there is I bet there is one exception in the PDB, but I bet you can't find ten. Oh, you can just Google yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So divide it over the hundred thirty thousand structures. Five different folds, not just five different uh, individuals in one fold. Uh, because it's end up being too expensive, right? So you need to nature needs to keep things simple. And with that argument. Anytime you're going to need a gigantic protein, such as the one of the iron channel, anything in a human in particular, it has to be decomposed in smaller units. And you're going to affect, you're going to have those folder units be the ones that are the folding units. Uh, I will show you one more slide, and then we'll take a break. Uh, so what the book, and I love the way the book brings this up, because the point is we always ask, we always start from a sequence and say, how will this fold? But I think the much more interesting question is the opposite. If you have a given fold, say a globin fold, what sequences would fit that fold? Because we know there are very few protein folds. And we, you tend to, I think you tend to think that any sequence will form a protein. And that's actually wrong. If you just randomly create amino acids, sorry, you can, you can do it till the days you're dead. You're not going to get a protein on average. So there are exceptionally few sequences that will even be stable in folds. And that means that it's much more interesting to think about if the folds are so special, what is it that determines when a, that a sequence is so special that we'll actually find one of those folds? Most sequences will not form a protein. And it turns out that some simple folds can host almost any, not any, but lots of sequences. And that's likely why they're so common. And as we're going to talk about after the break here, that if there is now some sort of defect, if one of the exceptions I had on the last slide, if you have a fold that somehow needs to create a very tight loop or something, there are going to be very few amino acids that can fit in that loop, only glycine, basically. And now you said that, well, you just reduced the number of sequences you can put in that loop astronomically, right? Because it's only if you have a glycine in those positions that you can even form that fold and have it be stable. So that if the more defects you have, you're going to need some very special amino acids, maybe even some uh, disulfides or something to stabilize it. And that means that that fold can only accommodate very few sequences. And it's going to be much less likely to find that by evolution or spontaneous folding. While good liberal folds that don't really have defects, they can host I was about to say almost any sequence. No, they can't host almost any sequence, but they can host many more sequences. And that's why they're going to be more common. But we're going to talk more about that after the break. Uh, it's 10.27, so let's meet here at 11. After the same, so my, the concept here I brought up, we somehow want to understand why do some sequences fit these common folds that we see everywhere, and what is it in these sequences that make them work that way? One example that we already spoke a lot about is the Greek keys. And the same thing here is that we need for this fold to even be possible to create, we need to have things that like to be in beta sheet all the way here, or they're not going to be stable in the beta sheet part. But equally well, we also need some super tight turns for the inner turns here. They should only be two, three residues. If they're more than that, they're going to start perturbing the next turb. And then we on the other, we need something, a large turn sorry, a large stretch of amino acid here that prefers to be coil or turn. Now that might seem obvious, but you might need 10 amino acids here. What if there are three or four of them that suddenly prefer to be in an alpha helix? Then you wouldn't get a, B, a Greek key, right? So for even for this fairly simple structure to form, there are lots of restrictions. Glycine is there, things that don't want to be helical there, and then the, roughly the same length of all the beta sheets. Um, if you, you have the same thing, if we compare different types of proteins, globular and membrane proteins. Globular can be a little bit mixed up, hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. So hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophobic. Well, if this is, this is probably more alpha helical than beta sheet, right? So one side of this helix might be hydrophobic, the other one might be hydrophilic. 
For a beta sheet, you could imagine every second one is hydrophobic and every second one is hydrophilic. For a membrane protein, it's much more common to have one hydrophobic region and then a hydrophilic region and then a hydrophobic region because they correspond to the transmembrane segments. And the fibrous proteins, on the other hand, they have exactly the same, they can have a mix of hydrophobic and hydrophilic, but they need to have the same repeat happening many, many, many times. And again, as we're seeing, as we're adding all these demands, we're seeing all the freedom we thought we had in the sequences slip away. And we've kind of seen that a couple of times that, I know when you see this, this doesn't seem so bad, that these defects, it can't be that bad. What if there's one unpaired hydrogen bonds? We can survive one bad hydrogen bonds, right? It's just 5, 10 k kilo, uh, kilocalories per mole. And what is the total stabilization, the total energy at least of an entire protein? That must be astronomically higher, right? It can't matter if you have 500 hydrogen bonds in a protein, how on earth can that one or two hydrogen bonds matter? It doesn't make sense. Same thing with beta sheets, right? It, it, the beta sheets should be large, so it shouldn't make sense. And, and yet, when we start looking at it, these smaller, it, you always see things going over that way. You virtually never see something like that. With beta sheets, we, I even talked about these things, left versus right hand turnovers, right? It's a very small difference. It's slightly better to move it in one way. And what always happens, when there are two ways to do it and one of them is slightly better, we never see the battle turn to. Although it's just one or two hydrogen bonds that matters. So there is something here we don't understand. The difference should be small, but in practice, well, the difference is small in terms of just 5, 10 kilocalories per mole. And yet that small energy is enough to decide that you will never see a protein versus a super stable fold. So the stabilization energy of proteins is surprisingly low. You can think of it as a bit of other ways. You could think of this in terms of entropy. Uh, so maybe it's this that folds that, if it's a very rigid small fold, then you're going to need to put things, that, that's a very low entropy state, right? There's only one specific way we can put all the amino acids there. While if you have a fold with a bit of flexibility, that would have much higher <coughs> energy, and, and that means, sorry, much, ah, much lower entropy there, right? Uh, so if you would have much higher entropy, that there more freedom, and that would create a lower free energy. So there's also an effect that folds that can choose between many different conformations, at least local conformations, because if you start to unfold, it's no longer in that fold. If you have some sort of built-in flexibility in the fold, it's likely good for you too. Don't worry, we're going to come back to this when we talk about protein folding transitions. And here you should be happy, because you've seen this before, right? How do you determine how likely things are depending on whether you see differences in energy or entropy? The probability of seeing something is proportional to an exponential minus delta E or delta F, depending where you're looking at energy or KT. The only problem is that it's completely wrong. It's completely wrong here, astronomically wrong. Uh, there is no detailed balance. And here we have this, why on earth does he keep bringing up detailed balance? So what was the assumption? Under what conditions did the Boltzmann distribution work? An equilibrium requires some sort of change, right? That you're visiting different states. And arginine never visits a serine state. The second you have picked your amino acids, you're stuck with those amino acids. So we never change between different things. So the problem is that the Boltzmann distribution directly can't explain why some amino acids are stable while others aren't. And this detailed balance has to do with this concept that you move both to the left and right over the barrier all the time, right? But an equilibrium means that the flow over the barrier from the left to the right is the same as from the right to the left. And that's why detailed balance was so important that I introduced it. So you, don't have any, you need to have an exchange between the states and we don't have that. Alexei likes to call this the multitude principle, which I, I think it's a fitting name. I think it's pretty much his invention. But, um, and his, his suggestion, the way to think about this, that the more sequences that can fit a fold without disrupting that fold or introducing defects in it or something, the more frequently you're going to see that fold. Because again, think of that as a liberal fold. It will accept almost any amino acid. While a fold that is very picky is not going to see 
So basically, as a restaurant that's very picky with its guests, it's going to have fewer guests. So that there is still something that's similar to the Boltzmann thing, that defective things are not impossible, just as high energy things are not impossible. It's just that they're less common. And we've seen this with helices and sheets and everything. Uh, there, as I said, there are a limited number of folds for globular proteins. You could argue that that was the case when we saw that we only had helices and sheets on the secondary structure level. Yep. Uh, I just had a question about the Boltzmann distribution mm -hmm. protein. So it's, um, it's not applicable because it's, there's no uh, exchange between states. But then does it, if you look at a number of proteins, will it still be that? I mean, it will still be that the so remember, now we were specifically talking about when we're looking at different sequences. Okay. So the, if you have one sequence and you think about what are all the possible states that this sequence will fold into and which one is going to be most stable, then you have detailed balance and then we have an equilibrium between different states. And then the Boltzmann distribution definitely applies. Uh, but if we're looking at should it be an arginine or a serine in this particular sequence, that is not something where we can use Boltzmann distribution for directly because we don't change them. And even if you think about that, even the amino acids we have, we have roughly the same number of hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids in your genome. It's almost 50-50. And that starts to relate already on the secondary structure. So what fractions of amino acids create helis, sorry, what patterns in hydrophobic versus hydrophilic create different types of secondary structures. Or if you look at the secondary structures that prefer to be, sorry, the amino acids that prefer to be an alpha helix secondary structure versus amino acids that prefer to be in beta sheet secondary structure. What determines the size of these elements, how large they are and how stable they are? So what do we need to get an alpha helix? Yes, but four residues doing what? Four residues that want to be in an alpha helix. And similar for a beta sheet. So when does the alpha helix start or end? If you want to ask how likely is it to have 20 residues in an alpha helix? Yes. Or a residue that does not want to be an alpha helix, right? So that at the start you need to have something that does not want to be in an alpha helix and then some things that want to be in an alpha helix and then other things that don't want to be in an alpha helix again. This gets complicated if we're going to start looking at the secondary structures here and everything. So you know what? Let's forget, because here you have some sort of, the repeat here might be 3.6 residues per turn. The repeat here would be two residues. This is an excellent example that we don't want to confuse ourselves with all that detail. So let's create a much simpler model. Let's just talk about these repeating patterns that I mentioned. So let's say that we have some sort of red pattern that is something, what we're interested in, and the blue dots is something that is not that. This can be an alpha helix, it could be a membrane protein, it could be anything. Because what I'm now interested in, how large are these, how large are these regions and why? And the book goes through this in a bit more detail, but I'm going to skip through it a little bit just to get to the idea. Whether you call this, here I said polar versus nonpolar. Forget about this specific property. But you have P is some sort of property. That, and the probability, these residues have that property. It could be that they like to be in an alpha helix. So P is a number between 0 and 1. And if we then want to ask, what is the, how long are these groups of those elements that we see? Well, to get something like, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, to get eight elements, we need to have something that is not P, and the likelihood of having that is one minus P. And then we need to have eight of them that are P, and instead of eight, we can say R. So that means that eight such are such terms, and then one more term that should not be P, right? That is the probability of having R such dots after each other. And then if you want, you can do the math. It's not super complicated, but it's... A, I kind of like, I am a physicist, I, I do think this is beautiful. Uh, even I wouldn't remember this. But just as you need to know your amino acids, I've done enough math and physics, if I see that, I go, oh, 
there are rules for these series. And I would look up my mathematics handbook, and then I would find out, oh, for this particular series, there is a, for that, sorry, for that particular series, something to the sum of p to the power of r from 1 to n, there is a formula for it. And then you use this formula, and then you need to recognize that the upper term here, the r there in front of it complicates things a bit, right? But you can take this normal series and take the derivative of it. Then the r is going to fall down here. And then you have to change that. that it's, it's actually fun, but it would probably take me half an hour to an hour if I didn't just follow the book. And this completely, this has to do with that we teach math different ways from what we do math. I think it's a super fun exercise, but I'm not going to bother you with it because it's not central. But if you do all that, that expression, that is the likelihood, the likelihood of having a certain length, because we want to calculate the average length, weighted with the likelihood of having each length, it simplifies to this expression. And again, I don't expect you to know it by heart, but the point is it's a fairly simple expression that just depends on what the probability p is of having something in the red state. And if you then take p and say that that's roughly 0 0.5, you would say that if there's something that is 50-50, the average sequence length we would have of these things is roughly 3. And that doesn't seem to ring a bell or anything. But this has to do with that we now there's a gross simplification. And any type of property, and you need, just need to put them off to each other, and the probability is roughly a half, you're going to see the average length of such elements is roughly 3. And then we could argue that in alpha helix, well, the repeating unit we needed to have, you can't, you're not going to have an alpha helix with one residue. You said four. Four, this would work with four, too. So three times four, that would be 12 residues. And that's kind of, that may be a little bit short, because again, this was an approximation. But the point is, we don't have 100 residues in an alpha helix. And the reason for that is, as we showed on the previous slide, that it's not that you can't have it. If you actually do take 100 residues that would prefer to be alpha helical, they would form an alpha helix. When we, when we just randomly mix, put this in a sequence after each other in the genome, the likelihood that you would never ever have anything that did not want to be alpha helix is very low. So remember that we had earlier on in the course, we had this argument about the shortest length of stability of the structures. And the shortest length had to do with the individual elements. And now we can start to start conclusions about the longest stretch. For the beta sheet, again, the repeating unit there would be 2, right? You need to, to get back to the same side, you need roughly 2. And 3 times that would be roughly 6. And that's also a bit short. So this underestimates it a bit. But the, the, rough, the sizes we have on these elements is not given by evolution or anything. It's fairly simple physics. They can't be too small, because if they're, no, if they're too small, what would happen with the secondary structures? We would pay in free energy, because we would only get the barrier and we would not get the gain. And here's the difference. They can't be too short because that's bad for physics. The reason why they can't be too long has to do with the probability in the genome. It's very unlikely that we put hundreds of residues after each other that would all like to be beta sheets. So there are different things that determine the lower limit to the size of protein, sorry, the size of secondary structures versus the upper sizes of secondary structures. And you can do that exercise. This actually applies to loops too then you would have three states, right? Then the loops should neither be helix or sheet. Uh, so that loops too, they have these characteristic lengths. It would be rare that you would have 500 residues and none of them would ever like to be helix or beta sheet. And then we removed even more of the structure of freedom we had. Um, you're not gonna have very large elements and you're not gonna have very small ones. I'll skip, yes? What do you mean by my, so this is again the matter, it's a probabilistic upper limit. Uh, so this is just the, uh, your genome is not entirely randomly organized, but uh, when you combine this with natural uh, selection, if things are, well, in, in your genome, the likely, how, what is, you know what the fraction of, hydro, you know what the fraction of residues are that prefer to be in alpha helical shape? So it's not really, a, no, it's not an upper, upper limit, um, apart from the number of uh, uh, genes in the, a uh, number of uh, expressed amino acids in your genes. But the probability will, of course, be so low that in practice you're never going to see it. There are some exceptions, but normal, I mean, normal helices would be up to, th the longest you would see in a normal protein might be 30 residues long. There are some exceptions in 
when you have coiled coiled helices. The alpha helices you're here again, it's, it's an exception. But that's not really a, a globular protein in that sense. But we still haven't answered the question that we were after. That 510 kilojoules or 1 kcal, why does that kill a protein? And we did study this the very first week. Um, and the very first week, we talked about how much we gained when we took an amino acid and put it on the inside of a protein or solvated it in oil or something, right? And what we're going to go through the next few slides is going to be very related to that, but it's kind of the opposite. And this is, of course, there is a connection to the Boltzmann distribution, but it's not quite as simple as we thought. So rather than worrying about that, well, actually, you can see the, the, the good illustration here is that if you see how common is it to have Re residues on the inside of <coughs> proteins. Uh, in particular, what is the likelihood of having something in the core versus the surface? And then you see that you have lysine and arginine here in the core, as uh, are in the surface, and then in the core you only have the hydrophobic ones. So there's almost a, not perfect, but there's a very good correlation between how hydrophobic things are and whether they occur in the core or inside. And that is definitely related to the Boltzmann distribution, because that had to do with individual existing amino acids. And if you, let's pick one fold, anything, myoglobin. And let's say that there is a particular residue 47 that could be either serine or leucine. And then we need to go back to what we did the very first week and think serine likes water and oil by roughly the same amount. So serine can go either way. Leucine on the other hand much prefers oil. So if we are in the inside of the protein and would like to expose something to water. For serine, he doesn't care. Leucine, on the other hand, then we would be paying two kcals, which is bad. But if you now think about this inside a protein, every single fold that has serine inside will also work with leucine on the inside, because leucine is going to be better to have on the inside, right? But then there might also be other folds Let's say my myoglobin had leucine in this particular point. If I now take this one fold with leucine and move it to a serine, it's not obvious that it's going to be stable because that's worse. So leucine will always be better than the serine, so I can always go that way, but I can't, I can't guarantee that I can go that way. Sometimes I can and sometimes I cannot. So that there is a relation between how stable a fold will be for a, pro, for a sequence and what the hydrophobicity or the salvation of the individual amino acids are. And this was related to Boltzmann distribution. So if you think about this entire protein now, my myoglobin, you could have a, the rest of the protein, let's say that the stabilization free end here is delta F, whether it's as 500 or 5 billion doesn't really matter, but it's some sort of large number. And the small contribution from this residue would then just be delta epsilon. So what we are interested in is that what is the total free energy in the entire system and what is the role of that small delta epsilon? And what I'm going to argue, and you can actually prove, you can prove this mathematically, but you can show it based on experiments that if you take any number of protein sequences you can imagine and mix them up and somehow we could measure the free energy, how it, much it would take to fold them into structures. Some of it would be positive and others would be negative. There is a, have you heard about the central limit theorem in mathematical statistics? So if you take lots of things and add it up, they will always be normal distributed. Any type of statistical distribution, like if you just draw lots and lots and lots of samples, you're going to end up with a distribution that looks like a Gaussian. And for that, you need to draw an infinite number of samples, uh, which we always joke about and say in physics is roughly 12 or so. Uh, and that's if you look at the age distributions or length distributions of students or anything, it's going to look that way. And it will look that way for proteins too. And what you're going to need to trust me for a second say, in general, this is going to be positive. So ge for general sequences, they won't even form proteins. But of course, there will be some small fraction, the black part here, that will be stable in this fold. Because we, we have seen the myoglobin fold. So the blue ones that are stable, and the, but let's then assume that I introduce one of these defects. The important thing is going to be when I cross this zero bar, right? If I stay below zero, well, it's not good that I introduce a defect, but in total I will still fold my protein. But the second that this effect is large enough that I cross zero, the protein will no longer be stable. So the part that matters is not this entire thing, but for the individual <laughs> mutation what matters is 
will I cross the zero bar or not? And since this is going to be very close to zero here, we're not down by the door there. This is a very small component. And again, if you're into mathematics, since you know the shape of this one, uh, and you have an average, which is delta F, we also have the standard deviation from the center, and you can formulate this as a Gaussian. Um, and if you formulate that as a Gaussian, you can say the likelihood that we are on the positive side, so that we're still, that the defect here doesn't screw up the total stabilization of the entire protein, so that I actually, so that I stay as a folded state. Uh, that would be an integral of this distribution I showed on the other hand, and then you're going to do a bunch of mathematics. Because this is an exponential, you will eventually end up with an exponential expression here. And that will depend on the small stabilization energy. And in the denominator here, you're going to have the properties of the distribution on the other side. And that had to do with the standard deviation of the distribution and the average value of the distribution. Don't worry, I don't expect to know this by heart. Uh, so you end up, the proportionalities we don't care about. But the point is that the likelihood that a, pro, that a fold will be stable Sorry, the likelihood that a fold will be stable with the sequence you just gave me is going to be an exponential that depends on the energy and then the sigma and delta f that we don't really know what it is. Have you seen things that looks like this? Of course you have. This looks, it walks and quacks like a Boltzmann distribution, right? It has exactly the type of shapes. But there is something that you don't see in this one, which is what? It doesn't say KT, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the Boltzmann distribution. It's just very, very like a Boltzmann distribution because it's coming from similar properties. But there is no KT here directly. So if this delta E goes up, the defect, the number of folds that will still be stable, well, this probability will go down, right? So as the defect energy goes up, the probability will go down. And this is the other reason why two weeks ago I had this corny slide where I showed you how quickly the exponential distribution, were, uh, sorry, how quickly the exponential function grows. It grows tremendously fast. So as this, you might think that the energy is low, but as the energy starts going up here, the probability here will very quickly be so low that things will never be stable. You can actually see something else from this that is pretty cool. Um, so we said delta E for a hydrogen bond, uh, that might be, say, 5 kilojoules per mole or something. What is all the st stuff you have here in the dom denominator? I'll just, I don't have this equation on the next slide, so just have a look at the equation first. So you have delta E in the denominator and then a denominator that is a quotient between sigma squared and delta F. Delta F, the average energy in something, that is proportional to the size of the protein. Do you agree with that? If the protein is twice as large, the, pro the energy in the protein is likely twice as large. When it comes to probabilities, the standard deviations, I know that you haven't talked that much about this course. I actually have a lecture on that, at least half a lecture later on the course. Understanding statistics is important, even if you're not going to be mathematical statisticians. The standard deviation sigma usually goes up at the square root of the size. So sigma squared will also go up at the size of the protein. But the denominator we had here was the quotient. So if sigma squared goes up as the size of the protein, and the energy also goes up as the size of the protein, this term will be independent of the size of the protein, right? Because you have a quotient of two things that both grow with the size. So what we really have here in this equation, we're saying that the probability to be stable only depends on the defect. It does not depend on the size of the protein. Yes? But if we have this to the power of zero? Sorry, if we have? The power of zero of sigma. No, so sigma is a standard deviation. Um, and the, the, the standard deviation, uh, we have a lecture on this, trust me for now. The standard deviation will grow as the square root of the number of samples. Um, it, it's still not obvious. Um, there's a sigma square, which is the variance, will grow as a sample. So what we're saying that, and, and the second we've seen that you can almost forget the denominator, it's just some sort of constant there. 
So the likelihood that a protein is stable, if your protein is 5,000 residues or 15 residues, the only thing that is important is those five kilojoules per mole. If you have a protein that consists of 100 residues, that can probably work. It's just you're going to need to make sure that you don't make the mistake in 20 places. Imagine you had a protein of 50,000 residues. You can't make a mistake in 50,000 places. So that it's the size of the protein is not relevant. It's only the individual defect energies that matter. And if you can actually think, I'm going to, I will come back to this KTC later. You can actually think of this denominator as some sort of characteristic energy. And the reason for that is that if the temperatures around you are, if the thermal energy around you is higher than this energy, we're going to unfold the protein, right? Because if the stabilization energy of a protein corresponds to KT, then we will have more energy than that at room temperature. The protein will not be stable. So you can, if you, you can, and this is beautiful, you can use temperature as a scale for energy so that the stabilization energy for most proteins tend to be 350 to 400 Kelvin, which corresponds quite well that you can denature them by heat at roughly these temperatures. That's parenthesis for now. But the important thing is that never compare the stabilization to the entire protein, just the defect. It's around the zero mark here. And that also means that the vast majority of the structures, all the things up here, will not fold proteins. You can, you can go and synthesize as much as you want. It's only if you by chance happen to end up in the black or the region below zero here that you will fold the protein. Everything else is just going to be a waste of money and synthesis. Then, of course, we haven't said how large this area is, but it's, it's smaller than you think. We spoke a little bit about packing. I will skip that. And there's a... Um, and here, too, I will skip this, too. Um, the book goes into some curiosity. No, actually, sorry, this I will include. This I will include because it's fun. Uh, you can make the math here. If you thought, is it more common to have heat, uh, sheets or helices inside proteins? And a helix, because it's more because you keep going, rotating around. For a given length, you need roughly twice as many residues in a helix as a sheet. The sheet is more stretched out. So let's say a factor two to make it easy. So that if we have the same, let's say we have the same upper side and the same lower side, uh, and we take, make something as helix or sheet, well, having lots of beta sheets, that means that you have six small components instead of three large ones. Which one will be able to organize in more different ways? You will have more entropy if we have smaller things we can organize in different ways, right? So in terms of entropy, that's going to be a better fold. So we normally want beta sheets on the inside and then maybe alpha helices on the outside. In particular, if the interior must be hydrophobic, slightly easier to achieve with beta sheets. So there are going to be many more sequences where we can create that way. So in general, you would not expect to see alpha helices on the inside of the protein. That's roughly OK. If you look at the protein data bank, it's much more common to have beta sheets on the inside of proteins. You will virtually never see a beat. You will, you will virtually never see a protein that is beta sheet on the outside and then a helix or two on the inside and then another beta sheet. And it's always good to make those checks because that that appears our simple models are likely true. But then, then there is the rule. There is always the exception to the rule in biology, GFP. Very cute protein. It's a beta sheet and then a helix right in the middle. <coughs> Can you imagine why it folds this way? This is not really many different beta sheets, right? It's effectively just one beta sheet, so you don't have a whole lot of freedom here <coughs> in organization, and they have to go around each other. This would just be a curiosity in physics and everything just to show that it can happen. It turns out that this is a super important protein because it's fluorescent. Not only is it fluorescent, but it's something that's a protein that's fluorescent that will bind different chromophores. So you can, we can express this. We can, if I inject this gene into you, you would be fluorescent if we have the right uh, chromophores. And not, uh, as I this, I wanna, so this is used in biochemistry labs all over the world, including this one. We love GFP here. And it's even cooler than that, so that uh, depending on the chromophore you add it, you can get normally, sorry, normally it would emit green light when you, um, 
irradiated with ultraviolet. And that's why that's a G in the green. But depending on uh, what motifs and structure here, you can get it to bind different chromophores. So you can get it to be blue, green, yellow, cyan, anything you want. And there was a group that was really skilled at starting to use this protein and everything. Uh, these things do occur in nature. This uh, one version of green fluorescent protein. Roger Chen, unfortunately, he died very young a few years ago. Uh, so sad. But his lab, so this is a, literally a small petri dish with lots of different versions of green fluorescent protein. So you can add as many colors as you want. And somewhere here you would think that, yeah, that's really fun if you're a researcher, but I'm so tired and this is grow up. Why are you sitting with coloring pencils instead? Uh, this is one of the coolest discoveries in recent years because you can use this. Um, and they have used it. They, they use it. You can mark things in live tissue. And they've used it as a surgeon. I think, let's see. I think, yes, I do have it. Um, if you're a surgeon and if you're going to cut a patient that has, say, a, a cancer uh, tumor or something, I'm not sure about you, but can you find the cancers here on the left side? But if you now create a green fluorescent protein that will, and combine that with antibodies or something, so that it will bind specifically to the cells that have the cancer tumor, and then you get that view. Green is cancer. Can you imagine how efficient you're going to be at cutting here? And again, if, if it's a very early stage tumor, it doesn't matter. But if this is advanced, you can't cut out the entire patient. The patient would die, or if it's in the brain or something. So being able to do a minimally invasive surgery, but it's still very important to actually get all the cancer cells. So you, you probably want a bit of margin here. Uh, sorry, this was not in brain, but ovarian cancer. Um, but there might be another complication here. Um, what if there is now a nerve? Go we know that there are nerves going here. If you cut the nerves, you're going to make the uh, patient limp. But you can add more GFPs. So now we add another GFP that marks just the nerves. <laughs> so you can literally, and, and they have been doing this in patients. Uh, so you can now have another, so you can basically tell the surgeon, cut green but not blue. <laughs> yeah. But the, but the cool thing is that we're not talking about theory. This works. So it's amazingly cool what you can do with it. So this is one small, simple protein. So you got the Nobel Prize for a whole lot of this work. Uh, so that you start to see after a while there is a certain pattern between the things that we find fun in this department and the Nobel Prize, because half the Nobel Committee is the colleagues upstairs. <laughs> um, we're going to, let's see, we, oh, we're doing good on time. Yes? No, it's not enough to do with GFP. So uh, GFP works really well as a marker, selective marker that you can get it to shine a specific color. To get it to bind to a specific tissue, you typically need an antibody. So you need an antibody that you know will bind to certain proteins that are expressed, say, on the surface of a nerve cell. Then you're going to get this antibody to bind to the nerve cell. Then you can tag along the GFP as a specific fluorescent marker, and then you tune your GFP so that this particular one will be red that you paired with antibody X. And then you know that anything that antibody X binds to is now going to be red. And then you create another antibody Y and mix that with another GFP. And that way you can say that anybody that antibody Y binds to is going to be, uh, what's it, yellow or whatever. Um, so this is also very much related to the thing I said about antibody design, right? You want to be able to design antibodies to very specifically target proteins or anything that's on the surface of the cells. But it's not that difficult to identify uh, cancer uh, tumor cells, for instance, because they express a huge amount of things on the surface. The problem is that it's not, ideally you would even like to selectively kill it or something, but that we can't do. Or in some cases we can't, but not in this case. Um, we're going to spend another part of the interactions and gradually get a little bit more into transitions here. Uh, I don't have quite as many slides tomorrow, so that, uh, let's see. I promised that we're going to end sharp noon today. And one of the things that we spoke about with the study questions this morning was how long it transitions between proteins. And I spoke about that when we talked about ion channels too. Proteins in general would be exceptionally boring if they did not bind and do things. This is something that you might not have seen that much about in structural bioinformatics. The problem is it's hard. That as simple as you thought you were, that you only had 20,000 genes, 
for each of those protein, there are going to be 20,000 partners that can interact with. So that's 400 million possible pairwise interactions. And in some cases, there is more than two partners in an interaction. There could be three. And then multiply by another 20,000. So that while you might feel that the number of proteins is limited, the number of potential interactions between things is insane. But we don't know a whole lot about it because in some cases we have X-ray structures of interacting things, but in general it's hard. And it, it's even harder if you don't know what it was interacting with. Uh, because in X-ray we would need to co-express them or something. So this started very early, actually, even, uh, even before we had structures of proteins. And the, the, the obvious question, what happens when things bind? Even these ion channels that I spoke about yesterday. And you might have seen this in textbooks and everything, that you have some sort of protein, an enzyme, an active site. And then we have our magic substrate here, and it fits perfect as a lock and key. And if you have the right key here, the key is going to fit in the lock, and we are very happy, and it's a beautiful world, and it's bound. Tell me if you ever find a protein like that, because that would be interesting. Um, they don't exist. But this was still, remember that, I, uh, that uh, I've said multiple times, models are never right, but they can be useful. But this was a very useful model, because it helped us to think about it. Uh, so this so-called lock and key hypothesis, historically important, but no real protein works that way. Then David Koshland came up with a model called induced fit, that for a very long time is how we've been thinking about this. And here you have the same type of enzyme. But you see what happens there, that what is the fit between yellow and green here? Not particularly great, right? But somehow, when the green substrate here binds to the enzyme, the enzyme will change shape and fit the, uh, the substrate really well. So that it's really that when the substrate comes here and pushes in, the, sorry, when the substrate comes, the substrate will induce a fit so that these two together, when they are forced to be together, they will suddenly adapt and fit really well. You can imagine like a crowd of students, and if there is a crowd of five students and the six students comes in, you will adapt and make room for the sixth one. That is probably good in a whole lot of other reasons, because it would also mean that once you have adapted here, you've likely found a more stable state. This is kind of similar to protein folding. If this state is, let's see, if this state is now more stable and everything, you're not going to want to release it and go back until some sort of reaction here has happened in your substrate. And when that reaction has happened, then we want to release it. So then it's good if it would release. That is a model that a whole lot of us have been very happy with for a few decades. The more modern structures we see, we're giving up on this too. And, and the reason for that is that if you start looking at our ion channels and everything, it's so much more complicated. Because we also need to think about these barriers. How quickly do things bind? And uh, the ion channels I spoke about, all these with anesthetics and everything, we actually know that they kind of breathe. Under normal. The channels is sometimes open and sometimes closed. And it actually has to be that way. Because if it wasn't that way, imagine that if you really wanted your ion channel to stay closed, then you would need a very large free energy barrier, right? So that we stay closed here. But like two seconds later, you know, somebody is coming around screaming, we have a nerve signal that has to be delivered. So <laughs> you need to get over that point. The amount of energy you would need to waste in your nerve system here, because now you would need to spend a huge amount of energy to suddenly get to this point instead. <coughs> and now we're here, phew, the nerve signal was delivered. Uh, your orders are now to go back. <laughs> and then we need to go back in. There would be, it would be so inefficient that you couldn't do it. So what rather happens is that you have fairly low barriers, so that in, under normal circumstances, the channel will sometimes be open and sometimes be closed. It's not specific to a channel. G-protein coupled receptors, most of these structures, remember the, uh, the receptor, the tyrosine kinase receptors I spoke about, that they somehow spontaneously dimerize, and then they diffuse away again. And the reason why we're learning more about this, we're, we can see many more things with time result spectroscopy and everything, that proteins move all the time. But in most cases, if two proteins bump into each other, they might release again. But they do, that does not mean they don't bump in. And so what we've learned now, that there appears to be most of these processes happen that 
it's not that my small molecule that would normally open the channel forces the channel to open up like putting your like forcing the door open but it's more like a door opening and closing all the time and then you put your foot in the door and when my foot is here you can't close it so that the small ligand binding here would the nor the molecule that would normally be say 90 percent closed 10 percent open when i put my small ligand there then it's if suddenly it's uh, the opposite 90 percent probability to be open 10 percent probability to be closed so I had selectively stabilized one state, but I didn't really have to alter the barrier. I didn't have to force it across the barrier, but the barrier was so low that this could spontaneously happen. And then the binding here just alters the equilibrium a bit. And I would say that 90% of the proteins we look at today are selected fits. This is the model by which proteins interact. Is this important for you beyond a mere theoretical exercise in physics? Any drug you're going to need to design in the future will have to be based on these mechanisms. You're going to need to find a drug that alters an equilibrium between states. Or if a channel is too closed and you want to open it, you're going to need to find a way to alter that equilibrium. Can you favor the state you want or disfavor the state you don't want? Remember, you can actually do both. So that any time you're going to do something, you have three states to play with. Start, middle, end. And if you want more of that than less of that, or do you want more of the transitions or not? There are more things to play with here than you can imagine. And virtually all of these things can be tuned by binding the right molecule to it. I'm going to show you a couple of it. Um, glutamate binding protein. Can you guess what the yellow part is? <laughs> it's glutamate. <laughs> uh, I've done, we wrote a paper on it. The entire protein here undergoes almost over half a nanometer of motion every time it binds the protein. There's a very large change. And it's, kind of, it's almost like you have a hinge here in the middle, right? You see that you only have, uh, it's one, the blue copy is one protein, the red not. So you just have two beta sheets here in the middle. You can probably say, guess something about the rigidity of this structure. That you have one fairly rigid domain here, and then very floppy here, and then very rigid here. So somehow nature has over billions of years of evolution coded for this that if you want something to move, you're going to need some small, very flexible region there in the middle. And Laura, I think that some of you talked to her about her uh, research project. What well, she's actually working on this type, not this particular protein, but similar types of proteins involved in uh, growth factors and everything cancer. And it appears to be that in many cases, actually these intermediate states, when there's such a small hinge undergoes through emotion, that really determines the binding state to which the antibodies bind, where we can identify this. So even in things as advanced as cancer and tumor growth and everything, it appears that the transitions are important, not just the states of proteins. And I'm so not saying that you should start doing computer simulations for all of these things, but there are a ton of experimental methods that are very good at indirectly getting access to these transitions too. So don't assume that your structure is everything. We also need to understand how they move. I promised you another protein a few lectures ago, uh, hemoglobin. Some of you might know this, uh, but this is one of the coolest transitions or uh, concepts of allosteria in nature. <coughs> Do you see that there's a slight difference between two structures here? So I'm just alternating between two structures. So first, hemoglobin was the more complicated brother of myoglobin. So that each of these, there are four subunits here, and each subunit is a globin fold. Uh, and the hemoglobin molecule needs all of them. So you have four binding sites for oxygen. And then you have two shapes here. You have oxyform, deoxy, oxyform, deoxy, oxyform, deoxy. Uh, and so they have been, people have been able to determine crystal structures of this in a saturated, oxygenated state with lots of oxygen. And you can even see that the heme group changes shape a bit. And then in another crystal under deoxygenated, oxygen poor conditions. So depending on whether you have oxygen bound or not, the hemoglobin will change its structure just so slightly. So what was the other thing we said about hemoglobin? We had these things with hemoglobin in, sorry, hemoglobin in your lungs versus myoglobin in your muscles, right? 
So what happens is that this is the same type of allosteric modulation as we had with anesthetics, but it's more complicated because it's the oxygen itself that is an allosteric modulator. So what happens here is that normally hemoglobin is not particularly fond of oxygen. It will bind, but it doesn't really love it. And that means that So the first, sorry, the first molecule, oxygen molecule I bind, I will bind it. But what happens when you start binding more oxygen, the mere fact that you're binding oxygen induces a slight shift in the hemoglobin structure. And as hemoglobin undergoes this shift, it moves to a state with higher affinity for oxygen. And this means that you're going to get a, nor, normally any normal molecule would behave like myoglobin here, so that Forget about the red one for a second. On the x-axis here, we increase the amount of oxygen. And the y-axis is here is the saturation is effectively how much oxygen I have bound. So any normal molecule that would like to bind oxygen is going to be super happy when you start having oxygen. But eventually, you saturate because most of your molecules will already have bound oxygen, right? So that the effect is strongest in the beginning when you're starting to bind oxygen. Hemoglobin behaves in exactly the opposite way. When you don't have a whole lot of, uh, when, they, when you don't have a whole lot of oxygen, it doesn't really help that you undergo this system because there isn't a whole lot more oxygen to bind. So the affinity is going to be low. While as this goes up, suddenly myoglobin, uh, sorry, hemoglobin wakes up, and in your lungs where you have very high oxygen pressure, hemoglobin will be fully saturated. So what's going to happen is that in the lungs hemoglobin starts binding oxygen and because there is lots of oxygen it's suddenly going to be really good at binding oxygen in the lungs. It will steal any oxygen it can in the lungs. And then it moves out in the bloodstream to your muscles. But in the muscles your oxygen pressure is low so that there will be an individual oxygen molecule here and there that unbinds. If hemoglobin behaved like myoglobin it would stay there. There would be the individual molecule here and there. But what's now happening is that the foot in the door effect disappears. Suddenly you no longer have the foot in the door. And as the oxygen from hemoglobin starts to unbind, hemoglobin will relax back. And then it doesn't really like to bind the oxygen anymore. And then it's going to start releasing even more oxygen. So suddenly when hemoglobin is in an oxygen poor region, it's going to want to release all its oxygen. And then, hem and then myoglobin takes over. And we should be pretty thankful for this because if this was not true, we would not be alive. So this was a famous paper in the uh, 1960s by uh, Monod, Wyman, and Changeux. Monod and Wyman and Dead, uh, Changeux is still alive. And we're actually, we're even colleagues. We, he too works on Ligeting Eight Rhine channels nowadays. Um, I'm, I'm actually a bit sorry that they never got a Nobel Prize for this. I, there is this whole culture around Nobel and everything. I think this discovery is too old. This will never get a Nobel Prize. It would have been worth one. Um, I have no idea why I didn't get it. Um, but in particular, with the two first co-authors being dead, uh, Charger would be worth an Nobel Prize, but he'll likely not get it, at least not for this. So that brings us to the last, yes, we have 10 minutes. Uh, I probably won't finish all slides. Um, so the last part that, to understand all these transitions, whether it's between allosteric states or whether it's folding and unfolding, we're going to need to start to look a little bit what happens when you actually fold and how quick do things happen. Uh, and we'll cover this in much more, great de uh, much more detail tomorrow, but I'm at least going to introduce it. Um, so we already separated this concept of thermodynamics and kinetics, right? And now we're going to move over much more to kinetics. We're only going to study how fast things happen. Uh, and most of the things that we look at just as hemoglobin, they have some sort of S-curve. So things start to happening, and, but the actual action happens in a fairly narrow range. Okay, so and this is a characteristic. Things are cooperative. They help stabilize it somehow. And there are a ton of different ways that we can unfold proteins. We'll come back to them. You also, I also already told you about Christian Amphison, which was the original experiment here, where he could show that you could select, yeah, you could repeatedly get... Uh, a uh, nuclease to uh, refold, and then you just measure the CD spectroscopy and show that it's actually adapts its native state again. But what all of these things, they don't really tell us a whole lot about the protein folding. If you really want to drill down and understand what happened in the proteins, uh, all we know that all these all or non transitions, beautiful as they are, 
all we really know that it's happened very fast. We don't really know that does the beta fold gradually fold and fold very fast or is it somehow, I argue that the beta sheet was a phase transition, but you just believe me, we haven't proven it. Uh, so we don't really know that, is it possible to have any sort of state in between here be stable? And that's hard to say conclusively because by definition, the intermediate states are difficult to measure. They will never be stable there, but can it be at least semi-stable? None of this is obvious from experiments. <coughs> We can measure most of these things. Calorimetry is by far these way. Calorimetry basically measures how much heat we're putting into things and how the heat capacity changes. Uh, and here too, if you start doing this for a protein, the protein will undergo some sort of transition that will depend, for instance, on the pH and salt concentrations. And after this transition, it will have denaturated and behaved slightly differently. But again, it doesn't tell us anything. It just says that there is some sort of transition that happens in a narrow range whether that has an intermediate state or something, we don't know. And this is a super hard problem that people have spent decades on understanding. And there are some pretty neat ways that we can get some information about it. Uh, Van Toff started studying this and his question was one that we already touched upon. What is a protein? I hand waved a little bit the first week. We still haven't answered that. What is a protein? Will five residues be a protein? So somehow we need a protein to fold, right? And have a stable state. But again, if, if you say that the protein folds, what is the melting? We had these gigantic proteins with millions of amino acids. Do all of those million amino acids fold together? Or do you have smaller beads that fold along the chain? So this comes down, what is really the folding or melting unit? How large is the part that really is a protein core? And I already hinted at you that you might have things on higher organisms that consist of multiple units, right? Then they're likely independent. And if the melting unit is the entire protein or folding unit, then it's definitely an all or none transition. If the melting unit is significantly smaller than the entire protein, then we can have the protein folding or unfolding in smaller parts. And you could imagine that the unit required is actually much larger than the protein, and then you would need many aggregates of proteins for it to be stable. Um, and if you think that this is strange, many of these uh, prion diseases probably belong down here. We can calculate this, and this is going to be another uh, equation. And I'm, I'm not going I promise I won't ask you to derive this one. But it's a beautiful example of what you can do with fairly simple mathematics and models. So what we would like to understand is that what happens when you fold. And I will actually, I would deliberately move forward. I'm going to move back to the other one. If you have some sort of process and then you go through that, well, there is something happening here over a fairly small temperature range. And in here we measure the energy, but if this is a protein and we're gonna measure what is the probability that it has unfolded or something, below this temperature is folded and after the temperature it is unfolded. And in this range, we can somehow talk about what fraction of the protein has unfolded. And then we're gonna worry about the different states. In this case, I won't worry about the barrier so that there is some sort of native state and there is some sort of molten or unfolded state. And that means that we can talk about the free energies of both of these states. And if we simplify the world and say the world only consists of these two states, the probability of being in the molten state, well, that would be the Boltzmann distribution, right, of that state divided by the sum of both states to normalize it. And then it's nice, rather than having to work with absolute energies, it's nice to introduce the differences between them. And if you do this and do a bit of exponential math, you can actually formulate this as a slightly simpler expression. But the important part is that only the differences in the entropy and energy go there. It's not hard, but it takes a bit of time. So that means that if we know the free energy between the states, then we can say what is the likelihood of being in the molten one. And always we're going, to need, we're going to need to find something else that describes these probabilities of being in things. And that's when we had this curve, that any time I have a probability or something, I wouldn't, if I want to know, for instance, how this changes, and we're definitely changing some things with temperature here, right? If we make a horrible approximation, that if it is over a na narrow range, and from that range we go from 0% molten to 100% molten, let's approximate this derivative with virtually a straight line. And if this changes from zero to one, it's just gonna be one over the temperature difference. 
So then I have an expression for the derivative of the molten here that we can get from an experiment. And I had an expression not of the derivative, but of the expression itself on the previous side for mathematics. So then I just take and derive that expression. And then you end up with a long, beautiful expression that we are so not going to derive. But it's not, again, this is not hard. It's just that it will take you 10 minutes to do. And you can translate that back, actually, to use, instead of having these large expressions, you can notice that that corresponds to the molten probability we had two slides ago. So now we can formulate the derivative. On the other hand, it's the probability of each part being molten. Sorry, in the probability of the protein being molten. And on the other hand, in the fraction we saw in this curve. And the cool thing is that now we have two numbers we can compare. Uh, at the midpoint transition, let's say that this is roughly 0 0.5. You're more than welcome to disagree with me. Pick 7.25 or 7.75. It's not really going to change things substantially. But right when we are making the transitions, we're roughly halfway molten. And then you can get a number for this probability and say that this depends on the stabilization energy. And then we get two numbers. One number we get from the experiment <coughs> per melting unit, we get this much energy. But I also know how much energy we have in total, because if you do this in a calorimeter, and if I have one million molecules, and if I need to add 10 million kilojoules per mole, <coughs> it's 10 kilojoules per molecule per mole, right? So I now have a number. I don't know what the melting unit is, but I know how much energy I'm spending per, molten, per melting unit. And I know how much energy I'm spending per protein. And now we can compare them. And it turns out that for virtually all, and this is more than hand wave, for virtually all small proteins, this fits perfectly. So one small protein, the entire protein folds as one. And for large proteins, this will correspond to one domain. So if you have a large protein with three or four different domains, and again, you've seen these domains in bioinformatics. And here's the funny part. What is a domain? Well, in bioinformatics, we like to think of domains as the part that evolution carries over. And when we look at this one, the, physics, the domains are also the independent folding units in proteins. And this is, of course, not a coincidence. Because if it's very rare and very difficult for random sequences to fold, what would you do if you were nature? Don't try to swap out individual amino acids. Swap out the entire domain that will be a stable folding unit. We're going to spend a little bit more time talking about this. Um, I will just I will repeat the last two three slides here, but I will gonna there is a fun story here at the end that I will go through. Um, all this has to do with denaturation, and we're going to talk a lot more about denaturation tomorrow. Um, when do proteins denaturate if you just increase the temperature? Well, they will eventually unfold because you're boiling them, right? And delta S, when they, one has to be a bit careful here whether we talk about folding or unfolding. But in general, when you unfold things, delta S is positive, it goes up, and that's good because you have more freedom. The protein is more removable. But S will also drop with temperature. Uh, which means that as you go down in temperature, you might have opposite effects here. So this becomes complicated. If you start drawing all these plots, and again, I'm going to repeat this tomorrow, but if you start drawing all these plots, you're already well aware that a protein has a region where it's stable, and if you increase the temperature too much here, we're no longer going to be stable. But just the mere shape of these curves indicate that if you keep dropping the temperature, at some point you should cross the bar at very low temperatures too. So proteins should not just denaturate by boiling them, but also by freezing. And there are some examples, a few very rare examples, you can show you a cold denaturation of proteins. So if it becomes too cold, the protein will unfold. Have you ever seen this in an experiment? Mm, but that's probably more. Due, that's probably more. That's it's a good. But that's probably more due to the fat, actually. Uh, so if I show you a bunch of proteins here, real proteins, this curves, the the shape, and these are these are experimental curves. The shapes here are interesting, right? Definitely for the cytochrome there. It's definitely going down, and the myoglobin too. 
and you can probably guess where the other one should go. So why on earth, why on earth didn't we extend the scale to the left? Water freezes at zero degrees centigrade, right? So it's hard to do experiments. So what they had to do in the preload, you, you had to add some salt or something to be able to, but then you add lots of salt, and then the protein is going to denaturate with salt. So it doesn't really happen. But in, in principle, apart from the fact that water freezes, this is true. You would have cold denaturation of proteins. And there are a few cases where this is important. Uh, cold shock proteins. There are fish, for instance, that live in Antarctic. And due to the salinity of the water there, the water can be minus 10 degrees centigrade. And these fish then they need, they express special proteins and special, special types of protein with special amino acid composition to make sure that they are stable even at very low temperature. There are similar effects at very high temperatures for bacteria living in volcano or so that need to be able to live and have their proteins be stable at 70 degrees centigrade. We're going to come back when we talk about those bacteria later in uh, nucleic acids. But that's all I had for today. Uh, a bunch of study questions. And uh, tomorrow we're going to be looking at the really fun kinetics. Because tomorrow we're going to be able to couple the most complicated things. What happens on scales of individual molecules with experiments that we're actually doing upstairs here. Super fun.